In today's episode of Podcast for Inquiry, I speak with Dr. Joshua Bowen. Josh graduated from Johns Hopkins University in 2017 with a PhD in Assyriology. Josh also holds a Bachelor of Science in Religion from Liberty University and a Master's of Theology in the Old Testament from Capital Bible Seminary and an MA in Near Eastern Studies from Johns Hopkins University. Prior to entering academia, Josh was a chaplain in the U.S. Air Force where he gained an AA in avionics. In today's episode, we talk about Josh's personal journey from being a fundamentalist Christian evangelical to becoming an atheist, and his motivation for writing the series, The Atheist's Guide to the Old Testament. We delve fairly deeply into the story of Exodus and its correspondence with what we know of history through contemporaneous literature and archaeology. I bring you my conversation with Dr. Joshua Bowen. Dr. Josh Bowen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today on Podcast for Inquiry. Oh, no, it's a real pleasure. Appreciate you having me on. I, I want to talk to you today about uh, your area of scholarship. So just to sort of set the stage, you are a biblical scholar, specifically an Old Testament a scholar. And by that, I mean, not, not just that you have read the Old Testament, which which you have, but also <clears throat> you are familiar with uh, everything that we know about the region at the time of it. So archaeolog archaeological digs and, uh, and and findings, our knowledge of the history of the countries, of the, of the empires that existed at the time, contemporaneous writings and so on. Is that a, a fair summary of your area of expertise? Sure. I mean, I think I know what you mean when you say I know everything about it. But, uh... <laughs> not, but, not everything, but, like, but you're, you're, it's your it's your area of scholarship. Yeah. My um. So I guess very briefly, I uh, you know I got a um a master's degree in uh, theology and where I focused on Old Testament studies. So uh, I think I ended up taking six years of biblical Hebrew and Aramaic and a little bit of Ugaritic and Syriac. Uh, and then I, I taught Hebrew for a couple of years while I was there. Uh, but then when I went to uh, Hopkins, um, I minored in Hebrew Bible, Old Testament studies, just because I had such a background in it. And then sort of expanded my um, my field uh, out to what's called Assyriology. Um, so it's just the languages and cultures of ancient Iraq and Syria. And it's, <clears throat> you know, it's designed to learn all the languages, the major languages that were used there. So you learn Sumerian and Akkadian so that you can read all of the literature and all the extant writings that we have um, because they inform greatly our understanding of, of the biblical texts. So, uh, yeah, I, I think what you said was fair. Of course, I, I just always think, uh, there, there are people that are so much better at me than this, but, uh, but I understand. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. So, uh, you've written uh, a couple of books and we'll get to those, uh, we'll, we'll get to those, uh, in, in a bit, but I want to sort of, uh, uh, just more generally, uh, I had a, a couple of guests that talked about uh, uh, about about Jesus, and uh, not only were they arguing that uh, the 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 Jesus story about being the Son of God and all this uh, and all of the miracles that he performed was was false, but that uh, but that Jesus himself was uh, a fiction. It was not a. It was not a, Jesus. It, Jesus is a myth, was, and it's not based on a real person who went around uh, critiquing the Roman Empire and saying that we should be nice to each other. And I've encountered a, a, a sort of a similar argument that one of the reasons why we should uh, uh, trust in the Bible and that we should look to the Old Testament, uh, well, look to the Bible in general and to the, the Old Testament in particular, uh, it, it, and that we should believe in some of the uh, uh, things that it said is that from what we do know about the world, what we do know of history, what we do know of uh, of uh, uh, what happened uh, between two and five thousand years ago, 
is recorded and is consistent, <clears throat> excuse me, and is consistent with what is in the Bible. And so with that as a foundation, we can then move on to the sort of more, the things that are not proven or not known, not agreed upon and the supernatural things, but it, we can start with a foundation of trust. And in your books, uh, and that are, that are called the, the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, and there's a, there's a couple of, there's two volumes so far, yeah. uh, uh, you you attack that foundation um, that we can actually take what's in the Bible uh, as a reasonably reliable guide to history as it happened. Yeah. So uh, can you, before getting into too much specifics, can you tell us what motivated you to 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 study that mm. and 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 to write these books and uh, and I want to get into a few specific examples, but but just in broad terms, why? You say we cannot trust that what is written in the Bible bears any relation to actual historical events. Yeah, very big question. Yeah, uh, well, and, I, I, and, this podcast for inquiry is not I'm about the small questions. <laughs> take it, take it, take it seriously. No. Um, so, yeah, the, the answer to that would be obviously incredibly nuanced. Um, so, I grew up uh, an evangelical. Uh, fundamentalist evangelical Christian for, I think I was 26 years. Um, and so what, you know, what that means for those listening that may not know is that the Bible was, you know, the inspired inerrant word of God down to the, you know, down to the letters, quite literally. Um, and so when you would read something in the text from a fundamentalist perspective, it was a very literalistic reading um, in the worst sense, perhaps, of, uh, of, that, of that word. Um, and so you would read things like, well, Genesis 1, God creates the, you know, the, the, the heavens and the earth in six days, rests on the seventh. Well, that's what happened. You know, six 24-hour periods, and now here we have everything. Um, as you know, so there's a worldwide flood. Um, you know, there's a there's a mass exodus from Egypt. All of these major, um, particularly something like the Exodus, but um, you know, as you as you look throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments, you see these things sort of uh, popping up uh, time and again to varying degrees. And you know that the way that I viewed history uh, and understanding the past was that there were a few. Um, like real solid pegs that you could drive into the wall. Um, and, you know, one would be like, all right, well, the Bible says the earth was created in six days, roughly 6,000 years ago. Boom, there's a peg. It's in the wall. It's not, that's a sure, we can hang something on that. We can build things, as you say, that we don't know necessarily yet, um, or that we're still trying to find out. That's a peg that we can we can know for sure. And here's another one over here. There's an exodus from Egypt. Here's another one over here. Um, you know, there's this worldwide flood or Cain and Abel, any of these stories. Um, you know, these are the, these are the things upon which we can build. Um, so then uh, I went to a very fundamentalist uh, university for my bachelor's degree. Uh, I went to Liberty University in Virginia, and then went to Capital Bible Seminary, which was another fundamentalist evangelical school. And then I was accepted to Johns Hopkins, which, you know, is not. <laughs> and uh, thank, thank whomever uh, that it was that it was not, uh, because uh, within a semester, really, of being there, uh, it became apparent to me that you know, uh, certainly, uh, we can't take, you know, the Hebrew Bible, the old Testament as this historically reliable source. Okay, so let's, let, can, let's, let's, can you talk about that a little bit more? So by the time you got to John, Johns Hopkins, you were in your mid twenties or so you. Yeah. Uh, right around 30, right around 30. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and you were, educated i'm assuming that right like you've been you've been studying you've been reading you've been going to and so what was it the milieu was was it uh, that that changed was that johns hopkins was the first time there was any sort of academic rigor uh, like was it was it was it a better 
education or was it that people came at it from a different perspective? Like, I'm interested to know that, you know, these pegs that you put in the wall, that was from the sounds of it, like the foundation of your Mm -hmm. entire worldview for what you say, like three decades or so Mm -hmm. crumbled within a single term within four months. That's, uh, yeah. That's rapid. So yeah. like what what caused it to collapse so rapidly for yeah. you? Uh, I interviewed John Collins from uh, Yale uh, Divinity School. And uh, one of the things that he said is he, you know, he's a, I think he's a, a Catholic. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously his scholarship is unsurpassed. Uh, he's, he's a phenomenal scholar. Of the Old Testament, and I remember interviewing him. Uh, I think we were talking about violence in the Old Testament, mm-hmm. and he was talking about some of his graduate students that came into his PhD program, and they were, you know, fundamentalist evangelicals. And he said, "The one thing that I can never take away from them ever is that they know their Bible." Um. And so did, there was. Did, when he, did, did he mean that in a normative sense, like he should never do that, or that he was he was incapable of of doing that? Uh, yeah, I, they knew their Bibles very very well. Okay. Um, and so whatever student came in, um, you know, I mean, to give you an idea, uh, when I was I think seven, uh, my grandfather used to to drill me, uh, saying the sixty six books of the Bible forwards. Uh, and then backwards as fast as I could. Uh, and I can still do it to this day, which is sort of sad. I, I don't know that I could do it backwards, but I can still do it forwards. Um, and so like sword drills, you know, the, the, the reason that this was such an important thing, and I promise I'm going to answer your question uh, where I'm going here, um, is that the text is what we have. And it's not just what we have. It's the only thing that is reliable down to the details, right? So anything else that you find in archaeology, anything else you find in other ancient inscriptions, whatever, uh, it has to pass the Bible test, right? To the point, I have a quote in volume one, uh, the Atheist Handbook, I have a chapter on the book of Daniel, uh, the dating of the book of Daniel, and a, a former colleague of mine uh, I went to, uh, to seminary with him. He went down to a Dallas theological seminary and wrote his dissertation on, um, something to do with the dating of the book of Daniel. And he has a a footnote where he says, um, the book of Daniel essentially is not just another source. It is the source against which all other sources must be measured. This is the mentality of uh, a fundamentalist evangelical that's coming to the biblical text. This is it, right? Right. I I, I spent one, a four month period uh, living with born again fundamentalist Pentecostals. That's how mm. they describe themselves, and uh, that this was their mentality. What you're describing it was exactly their mentality. Uh, they said to me at one point that. Uh, evolution is nothing but a theory hatched by scientists for discrediting God's true word in the Bible. That's it. And, 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 and it's because the Bible is true. So if, if scientists are saying that you know, humanity came to be in a way that is different than what the Bible said, then so much the worse for yep. scientists and, and all of science, if it means, if it means even doubting one word, that's right. Bible. So I've, I've encountered, I've encountered that, uh, that mindset before. And so be- because of that, there is no tolerance, uh, really in any regard, but there really is no tolerance from a historical perspective. So this is why people will fight so ardently for things like the dating of the book of Daniel or for the mosaic authorship or for a particular event like the Exodus or something. The, the, the reason is because there's no slippage allowed. There is no tolerance. There's no flexibility. It has to have happened in just this way. And the reason is, if there's a, if there's a chink in the armor, it all falls apart. That's what happens with this, in my experience, and certainly in my personal experience. Um, the fundamentalist evangelical interpretation says it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Um, 
And so what happened for me is uh, I knew the biblical texts incredibly well. And what I mean by that is uh, like we, we studied uh, textual criticism, learned Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and all these other biblical languages. Like we really, really worked very hard on them because it was, again, it was getting down to the very, you know, grammatical forms because that's where the truth is. So if you're going to get to what the truth is, you have to learn the language. Um, but what that meant was when I got to Johns Hopkins that first semester, I had to take things like the history of Syria, Palestine, right? Um, I had to read things like ancient Sumerian and Akkadian literature. And what ends up happening when you do that is you begin to realize as a former fundamentalist or as a fundamentalist, um, the biblical texts were not handed down from on high in a vacuum, right? The flood story comes from somewhere, right? Uh, Exodus 20 to 20, that comes from somewhere, the, the, the covenant code, uh, the laws that are there. Uh, again, they don't just, they don't just spring up out of nowhere. You know, Genesis one is pulling from this other former Akkadian text. Um, and, and, and so, when you when you realize those things, you know, for maybe a, a more liberal, more progressive Christian, evangelical Christian, you know, they've they've sort of worked on those things a little bit. So a friend of mine, uh, Caleb Howard, who who came out of an evangelical school, uh, but was not a fundamentalist, when he came to Hopkins, his faith was unwavered, uh, unshaken. He remained unwavered, and uh, because he had he had thought these things through. Now that doesn't mean that he was right. Um, obviously, I don't, I don't think that he was. Um, but he had. This is where apologetics sort of came in, right? Mm -hmm. Apologetics said, "Well, okay, yeah, uh, we don't we don't really need to think about two and a half million, three million people leaving Egypt because it's possible that." You know, this word thousand here in Exodus twelve thirty seven doesn't mean six hundred thousand people. Maybe it means like six hundred military units, right? So the number can be much smaller. And now that can sort of work maybe with other archaeological evidence better. Right. So it's a type of apologetic that says we can we can work with the data a little bit. But that type of more progressive thinking is not allowed in fundamentalism. And so you know it's 600,000 is what it says, right? Uh, 15th century is what it says, right? So um, for me, what happened is when I was confronted with this data, historical, archeological, literary, um, it, 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 it shook and crumbled uh, that foundation, because if one part is wrong, all of it's wrong. Right. If, if the Bible is the inerrant word of God and one word is, is wrong, that means God made a mistake. And that's, that's, right. that, that's, that's right. not compatible with the fundamentalist perception of God. And what that did to me um, is it, I like to describe it as it sort of made me take a step back. So, like, my wife is a Christian, right? She's an Anglican. She grew up Anglican. Um, she is an Assyriologist as well, right? She, I met her at Johns Hopkins. Um, <laughs> and so she knows all the stuff that I know, right? She is, by the way, Bart Ehrman's uh, podcast host for his new podcast, uh, Misquoting Jesus. Uh, so, I mean, highly intelligent woman. Um and so, like, her her belief is not ill-informed, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, but the difference is that, you know, she doesn't read the Bible through that interpretive lens at all, right? It's, uh, it's, 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 it's a vastly more liberal, progressive reading of the text, understanding of ancient texts. So, but for me, what happened is um, it made me essentially start back over. And take this step back and look at all the data again and say, okay, is it possible that there's a God that stands behind this text? 
yeah, I mean, I guess that's possible. Does it seem likely to me, given the data? No. So I feel like it, it allowed me to sort of take a, a more objective view again and come to the data. I don't want to say completely fresh. Obviously, that's not going to be possible given that we have biases. But um, that's what happened to me is it, it just sort of blew me back and made me look again at the data and say, ugh, I, you know, obviously that interpretive model is wrong. But really, do I think that there's a God behind this at all? I, I don't see why I should think that, um, given the nature of the data. That, uh, that, that, must have, uh, uh, that must have been quite the journey for you. I, it was very difficult. Um, there's a video that's up on our YouTube channel, uh, Digital Hammurabi, where I, I talk for like an hour and a half just about um, that transition. It's called, um, what did Megan call it? uh it's like a, a an, an academic's journey from um faith to agnosticism or something like that and you know i left christianity kicking and screaming um so this idea that you know i just wanted to sin or um you know, I, I knew God was true, but, uh, you know, I, I had ulterior motives or something, or I just wanted to condemn the Bible. I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. I spent the entirety of that semester staring at the text. Saying, that can't be right. That can't be right. Uh, you know, um, and ultimately, I just I just had to say, I, 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 don't, I don't know what else to do with this. Right. And I remember I spent a lot of time with a former seminary friend of mine. Every Thursday night, he would drive up into Baltimore and take me out to dinner. Uh, we go out to dinner. He'd pick me up. We go out to dinner, get some pizza, and then walk around a parking lot and like sip a coffee. And we just talk about my deconstruction and ultimate deconversion. Um, and, you know, he, 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 he tried to kind of, you know, pull me, pull me back. Uh, and I mean, I, I admire his efforts. I mean, they were, he was a really good friend. Um, but the reality is that uh, as much as I wanted to, I just couldn't reconcile those things to a point that I would say it's more likely than not that this is true. Okay. And uh, I will link to your, uh, your talk about uh, your deconversion, as well as to your YouTube channel, you can find you. both of those in in the show notes. So uh, if people are more interested in more detail about that, uh, uh, you can click on on those links. Uh, you you've clearly come to the opposite end of the spectrum because you've uh, um, you've titled your book "The Atheist's Guide to the to the Old Testament," and I want to I do want to talk a little bit about the the, the contents of it. But before we do, uh, one might get the impression based on just the title to judge to judge your book by the sure. cover that uh you are no one is as uh vigorous an anti-smoker as a former smoker mm -hmm. and so as a former evangelical christian one might think that you are angry and you've got an agenda and that you are uh, not writing a work of scholarship here but you are writing a work of well uh, sorry I, I was i was going to say a work of propaganda but that's probably too too uh they too wouldn't say it's too far that, that's uh, that's what they'd say <laughs> okay a work of propaganda but what, what you've got here is a screed right you've got a polemical yeah. you've got a polemical essay here where you're cherry picking data, if there's any data at all. Yeah. And I, I'd like you to to talk about what the purpose and content mm -hmm. of the book is in general terms. And then and then I want to get into some, yeah. uh, you know, some some of the detail. Um, yeah, I, so I get that quite a bit. Actually, this past week, um, I had someone who's never spoken to me, uh, who's, you know, read two comments of mine, uh, on an app called Clubhouse, uh, I made two comments, actually just asked two questions. And um, they assumed they knew everything about me because they clicked on my um, <coughs> little profile thing and it said, author of the Atheist Handbook of the Old Testament. That's all they needed. Right. Um, so no. yes, I hate God and I love my sin. And um, 
and 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 so uh really i'm just i'm beating every bush turning over every rock in order to find anything that might be able uh to help me uh destroy someone's faith in god that's 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 sort of the caricature right uh, of who so, i so am what, so what what was your motivation for the the book and its title and like what what's in there not in specifics but in, in general terms what's what's in there so the uh, i promise it's going to sound like i'm not answering your question but i am uh, I, okay. I i i will get there uh because i think this is important um i i first found myself watching youtube uh by watching videos by Aaron Ra, and he would he would debate um kent hovind and I found those so funny, uh, but I started watching them. And then I started watching more things by Aaron and Aaron ended up having a conversation with a gentleman who started saying things like, well, the Hebrew says this and the Hebrew says that. And of course, you know, Aaron, he has his, his strengths, which is uh, certainly vastly outside of my field and uh, unbelievably necessary, um, but, you know, Hebrew, Hebrew's not one of them, right? Nor should it be. Um, right. And so he found himself going, well, that doesn't make sense, but I can't really say anything about it. And the other person then capitalized on that. And uh, of course, not to victory, because it's Aaron, you can't, <laughs> you can't get to feed Aaron Roth. But um, the, uh, it, it spurred me to uh, start reaching out to people like Aaron uh, and other uh, content creators to say, look, here's my background. Here's my training. If you ever want um, some clarification, good or bad, right, uh, uh, on ancient Near Eastern studies, the languages, the Hebrew Bible, any of these things, just let me know, right? I can, I can at least point you in the right direction of where you should read. Um, and where that landed us was creating this YouTube channel and the YouTube channels it's its only purpose when it was formed again remember my wife is a Christian she's an Anglican right uh and we did this this is her channel um it it landed us providing er, attempting to provide a place that people could come and get reputable more foundational scholarship on the ancient Near East and the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. That's what that's what the goal was. So just factual to the best of our knowledge from from the best scholars and yep. the best uh, experts of in, in, in various fields, it, your, your YouTube channel would would, would provide it in as a, a fair manner and accurately as possible, not not from any particular slant. Yeah, I mean, what we do is we try to present consensus scholarship that's the goal um because there there are things that are debated obviously in every academic field that's uh, of the study. nature of the academy yes but there are lots of things that academics in a field all begin with right there's a reason they go get bachelor's degrees and the master's degrees and these things because there's this like this core of information that everybody like we we agree on this, right? The data supports this. So well, you know you can't we learn about chemistry and physics. We're ever, we're not going to. You know, water is made up of two hydrogen and one oxygen atom. That's right, and, and that's and, not going to change whatever else we learn. That's right, and in in this field, uh, you know, in the humanities, it's 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 slightly different, but I mean, very very similar. Like in Sumerian, Lugal means king, right? There might be a slight nuance if somebody writes a dissertation trying to like make it a slightly more of like a ruler as opposed to our idea of king, whatever. It, it's like this ruling person that's at the top. Um, and you, you, you build on top of that, right? So th that's what happens in the field is there's this like this set of foundational things like, okay, when was writing invented? We know, right? Uh, you know, what's the basic history of this region here? This is what we know. Here are the kings. Here's roughly, you know, what everybody agrees on that they ruled. This is what they did. Um, those are the things that we all build upon. Unfortunately, in fundamentalist evangelicalism, very, very often, uh, what they begin with is completely at odds with what consensus scholarship 
of academics in the field begin with. And so what ends up happening is when they have these major starting point differences, then they build in such a way um, that people over here are looking at, you know, these, these fundamentalist apologists and going like, what, like, what the hell are they doing over there? Um, you know, we, we, for example, when you have somebody that has like a Genesis, uh, answers in Genesis, maybe I think is one, uh, where they say like, we had a worldwide flood in the middle of the third millennium, like people over here are going, what's, What's that now? Like, <laughs> uh, like, yeah. let me show you all the economic texts. The story of, of, of Noah's flood and, yeah. and, and the ark, right? Yeah. It's, it's like, let me show you the, the uninterrupted um, cultural uh, developments, you know, these, these major cities, you know, these, these regions, these kingdoms. And let me show you the, the cuneiform tablets, the clay tablets that we have that go right on through that period, right? So false, right? Nobody's going to think that. At no point was all life on earth or all life on land extinguished except for two of each type and then had to repopulate almost from scratch. And, That's and correct. The humanity never got down to like just the one family that was on the That's earth right. and, then, That's right. and then repopulated the planet. And so the, the reality here is that that's consensus scholarship, not just in liberal circles, right? That's consensus scholarship everywhere, right? Um, so you, you, you don't have like this serious pocket of Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern scholars who really think there was a worldwide flood uh, in the middle of the third millennium. You don't, it's not like there's that and then everybody else and they're debating and it's fierce. No, it's like there's nobody that believes that. Nobody thinks that. Um, and so because of that, our goal was to try to help everybody that's interested in this field establish that foundation, at least more than what they have. Because what ends up happening, and this is, uh, this is really the motivation for me and, and maybe even more so, or certainly, certainly just as much, uh, but I would say, um, for Megan, as for me, is that we are trying to um, bring down this interpretive approach, this fundamentalist evangelical interpretive approach to the text. Because what happens with this approach is you read ancient texts in such a way that you say, they're inerrant and inspired. I know what they say. And look at this law. This law says gay people are bad, right? This says that women, you know, that the consent isn't really a thing. Um, you know, this says that uh, you know, th th it establishes the patriarchy. It does all of these things um, that are just terrible uh, for humans, <laughs> right? I mean, we've learned this. Uh, as as we've progressed morally, and so what what we what we end up hap, uh, uh, doing on the channel is looking at this what this interpretive approach does in this fundamentalist Christian apologetics, and we say, gosh, that is just that they want to restrict the rights of others. That's what they want to do, right? And they want to do it based on this interpretive approach because they say, I understand the text; it's inspired by God. What it says is what we should do. Done. Um, and, and so what, what our goal is, is to provide this foundational consensus scholarship whenever we can, to be able to say, look, here's what everybody in the field agrees upon. Now, apply that to these really contentious, for some reason, topics that are debated online. Um, and we can talk about some of them, but they show up in the book. Um, and to be able to say, look, you should not, but in the end, my goal, and Megan's goal, uh, more mine, because this is this is my field, uh, that the biblical side is more my field than hers. Um, but my goal is for someone to walk away from my books or videos or whatever, and to be able to say, maybe I should be thinking differently about how to interpret the Old Testament. Maybe I shouldn't be interpreting it in such a way that when I finish, I say, uh, well, I'm going to base my values and my ethics and my morals uh, on this ancient text. Maybe I shouldn't be thinking that way. 
Right. Maybe I shouldn't be trying to restrict the rights of the LGBTQ community because of what it says here. You know, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, our guest uh, just a couple episodes ago was Phil Zuckerman, and and mm. the main the main uh, argument that he made is that no sacred scroll, well, no scroll that is sacred can be a, a reasonable foundation for yeah. morals or or ethics, both uh, uh, both in principle, just yeah. it, no matter what it says, and also when you look at what things like the Bible or the Quran say yeah. uh, that just in the specifics that it, things that it says are moral are, are, are not. Yeah. So it's interesting. You're coming at it from a very different perspective than, than he does, but you've, you've, you've come to a very similar conclusion. Yeah. So your book, uh, your, your book is an attempt to synthesize all of the, what, what you call consensus scholarship, all the things that basically anyone with any real knowledge has agreed upon and then applying that to the to the stories of of the old testament that's correct okay so let's i'd like to uh you you filled two volumes so far and uh you're not done (laughs) or at least yeah there's there's more of the old testament i'm not sure if you're writing a third volume i am yeah okay so there'll be there'll be a number three to, to come out but um i'd like to talk about what is one of the most famous stories from from the Bible, and it's really foundational to a lot of uh, uh, people's faith, and that's uh, the story of, of Exodus. So the Jews, uh, I'm just going to give a very brief summary. Anyone that's watched the Ten Commandments, it, it it's what's portrayed there. The Jews were slaves in Egypt; they wanted to be free. There were the ten plagues. Finally, Pharaoh says, "Okay, fine, you can go." He changes his mind, and as they are, then Moses parts the Red Sea, uh, or God parts the Red Sea. Uh, 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 and uh, the the Jews cross the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army uh, goes in, is drowned. Then uh, the Jews wander in the desert in the Sinai Desert for forty years until finally they enter the Promised Land, the Holy Land of, of Israel, as God promised them. Um, and not a single person who was born into slavery entered into into, Isra- into Israel. So that's why they had to. That's why God made them walk around for 40 years or something like that. Uh, so there's a lot of, um, uh, there should be, even though this happened several thousand years ago, there's a lot of stuff that's told there that we should be able to uh, to track. I mean, we're talking about a mass migration of a significant portion of, of the population of Egypt, uh, wandering around in a desert for 40 years, uh, an entire army killed, drowned in one fell swoop. Uh, is there any uh, correspondence uh, in what we know of the time from physical evidence to uh, the story of Exodus as I've just described it? And did I do a reasonable job of, of summarizing this? Oh, story? yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, and this is, um, you know, I think that... Um, understanding that basic background like that um most everybody i think that has that has grown up in part of the judeo-christian um religion the exodus is such a popular story Mm -hmm. um i write that's why i I chose it (laughs) in uh you know in volume two for uh, people that haven't read it uh i have a chapter on the exodus and i open it with a story about my father uh, and my father is, you know, he's six, four, uh, I think when, you know, at the time is probably right around two eighty five. you know, he's, his, his hands look like baseball gloves. He's just a monster of a guy. And uh, I used to work for, uh, work for him with him later in, uh, in his construction company. And, uh, he, he didn't have the greatest singing voice in the world, but when he would really get going, out there, he'd be swinging that big hammer and he'd sing, oh, my Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I got to do is follow, right? He'd bellow it out. Um, and was my dad a scholar? No. Like, did he know all the details of the Exodus? No. Uh, could he have like told you like a general story? Probably. But I mean, you know, but the thing is, um, the Exodus is so foundational because of what it represents, Mm -hmm. whatever it is that somebody thinks about it, whether there's a historical kernel of truth or whether it's actual historical reality, you know, whatever it is that somebody thinks about it, what they all walk away with is that when times get tough, when things get bad, 
God is still in control, and he and his time in the right way. Uh, you know, just as Gandalf said, a wizard is never late. He arrives precisely when he intends to, right? And that's what they think, is, is God is never late. He arrives precisely when he intends to. Um, God is going to bring you out, right? He's going to lead you through the wilderness. So then the question is, um, what can we say about it? Right? What can we say about the correspondence uh, of that story and how it's described in the biblical texts with what we know archaeologically, for example, or historically? You know, not good news for um, you know those that hold to a fundamentalist approach to the text. It's not. It's not good news. Um, there is a scholar that sort of has has spearheaded two scholars that sort of spearheaded historically the um i don't know the arguments for the exodus and having it uh correspond archaeologically to, to you know to what we have and that is james hoffmeyer uh out of trinity and kenneth kitchen an egyptologist both egyptologists and brilliant scholars i mean take nothing away from them right brilliant egyptologists the problem is um and I'm not an Egyptologist, just so everybody knows. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I, I rely on the work of other Egyptologists and those that that, that, that study these things. Um, actually, Ronald Hendel, who's a biblical scholar out in at Berkeley, uh, has done a couple of interviews, several interviews on a channel called Myth Vision with a friend of mine, Derek, and talked about the the Exodus. And one of the things he's he's critiqued quite openly, um, James Hoffmeyer. And the reason is that uh, there is, you know, if you if if you think about like a radar sweep, when that radar sweep is out here uh, sweeping across uh, aspects of Egyptology or biblical studies that don't have anything to do with something like the Exodus. Uh, the scholarship is great, right? When it sweeps across the Exodus, there are theological commitments that now get factored in. And so you begin sort of with this idea that all right, we, we, sh we should trust the Bible. We should trust what the Old Testament says. And so how do we then come to the data and make those things sort of line up? Um, and so one of the things, like the major thing that James Hoffmeyer does is he says, okay, if we can paint the picture, if we can set the stage uh, for the Exodus in the second half, maybe the latter half of the second millennium BCE, um, the latter part of the second half, sorry. Um, and, and we can say that the cities that are described and the path that they took if those things fit, we don't actually have to find positive evidence. We don't have to actually go find sandals, or we don't have to find you know uh, excavation layers of you know material culture from you know two and a half million people, or whatever. Um, it's just that because we start with the basic reliability of the Old Testament and the story itself, um, if we can say that the stage that was set in antiquity fits with what we would expect and what the story says, then that's that's pretty good evidence to get us down the road. Um, but isn't that like saying, uh, since Spider-Man is set in New York City, and we know for a fact that New York City exists, that that's pretty good evidence that Spider-Man is is real or so, so this is like, yeah, this is though this is sort of the one of the big critiques against such a position, right? Um, and that's why he's vastly in the minority uh, in in <clears throat> in taking this uh, you know sort of taking this approach um, because ancient writers are no dummies, right? They're not they're not uh, untrained in what they do, and so they have the ability to create stories that have verisimilitude, right? They 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 can create stories that, as you say, with Spider Man. Um, uh, or something, you know, like the movie Hancock, right? If you've if you've watched Will Smith in the movie Hancock, like what he does, flying around, buildings around, like it it all fits, 
right? It all there's nothing that the that the um, uh, I think it takes place in L.A., but there's there's nothing that the the viewer looks at. And there's like a spaceship that flies by or something, right? I mean, or people living in underground tunnels or something. That you don't see anything like that because it has verisimilitude, but it doesn't mean because that's what we do uh, to create that that illusion of reality, right? Of of, of historicity, and of course, that's not what you know Marvel. Uh, is is doing to try to make you believe that it actually happened, but that's they're trying to make it so that you identify with it in that way. Um, so what do we have? Well, uh, if anybody's interested, uh, the, in, in the book, there's an extensive bibliography. If anybody's interested in this topic, uh, so you can, you know, you can go just, you know, look at the, look at the back and look at the footnotes and you can see where I'm pulling all this information from. But this is the consensus position. And the consensus position is that the story as described and depicted in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, is not historically reliable. Now, positively, is there consensus? No. Um, so there are some that would say, yeah, there's a like there's a kernel of truth. There's like a like a small group, maybe, of slaves that left out of Egypt, and they joined ultimately with uh, this group called Israel that was already established in the highlands um, of Israel. And so that, you know, that they brought with that, that, that story, and that story developed into like sort of a national myth, right? Is that possible? Sure. I mean, that's possible. Um, that's very different. In, in, in Yes, very like, different. Like, yes. Okay, there's a kernel there, but that's... Yes. Like, you know, like a small splinter group escaped and that's joined right. with an existing group, and then yeah. and then the myth grew out of that. That's scene. right. That, that's very different than the story as as told. But that's why I say even, even that bit. Just to be clear, yeah, even what you just said is that's not is that consensus scholarship or is that a possibility that some people are willing to admit could be. Yeah, like, that's a that's that's a possibility. There, like somebody like Ronald Hendel would say that cultural memory is what stands behind it. Um, if you read through, oh, I won't go through all that, but um, what like there's a really great quote, um, and actually, if I've got the book, I could probably find it. Um, so there is a really great quote um, in this uh, edited volume that talks about um, archaeological stuff, and again, it's cited in the book here. But I'll just I'll just read it because it really sums this point up well. I think. Great. Uh, did anyone from Canaan ever govern Egypt? Yes. Did herders from the southern Levant bring themselves and their flocks into Egypt? Yes. Did people or armies of Egyptian origins ever invade Canaan and destroy its cities? Yes. Did Egyptians ever enslave Canaanites? Yes. Were there sacred mountains in the Sinai Desert? Yes. Were there groups of people with names like Israel or Hebrews? Yes. Did large numbers of people settle new territory in Canaan? Yes. Is there any non-biblical evidence for worshipers of a god, Yahweh? Yes. Here's the key. Unfortunately, the evidence for all these yes answers does not lead us to a single collection of tribes known as the Israelites and their activities over a period of 40 to 45 years. The events and activities comprise a wonderful background setting for the dramatic Exodus story, lead, lending its plausibility, lending it plausibility, but failing to support the historical accuracy of this specific tale. In other words, we have throughout the second millennium these things happening, people being enslaved in Egypt from Canaan, right? We have actual documentation and papyri that talk about like people, two slaves that escape uh, and, and are tracked as they escape out of Egypt. And the, the actual path that they take out is sort of similar to what you see in the biblical narrative. So you have these similarities. But the problem is that when you try to then like bring them all into a single Exodus event, you can't because they're spread out. Um, and they they don't occur in the same way that the biblical story does. But it makes sense why those pieces of the puzzle would be in there. Because, yes, there are slaves that are down in Egypt. Yes, they do come from Canaan. Yes, Egypt does have control over Canaan. Like, there is slavery. It's, it's, 
it's but you can see why that would be the case in the same way that you do have vendors on the streets of New York City, right? You do have uh, car chases where people are shooting machine guns out uh, of their windows. Like you do have you do have all of these factors. But is there a particular moment in time when all of that stuff fit together as it does in the Spider-Man story? No. Right. Um, and, and so that but that's why they do it that way, because it fits overall as a nice background right so they they take yeah they 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 take the the world that they were living in and yeah. and they use that as inspiration to to tell a good story but the reality is that it didn't actually happen in yeah. that way or, 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 or and the supernatural elements and the lessons that we draw from that are therefore based on a fallacious uh uh foundation that's right that's and a, a fair summary there. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And I, I will say this, and I obviously don't have to go into any detail about it, but the real problem, for, in, in my opinion, when you come to the Exodus story in trying to establish the validity of the biblical text and the story that is told there in the way that it's presented, right, from this more fundamentalist approach, is the conquest. Because if you take the Exodus mm -hmm. as historically reliable, then you have to take the conquest as historically reliable. Well, I, I I I I glossed over that aspect in my summary because I figured my summary was was long enough. But uh, I, uh, can you give a brief summary of the conquest yes. and then and then continue because I th that may that part is I've I've learned from my conversations with a number of people that part is less well known. Mm, yes, so. When we look at the Exodus and people uh, try to find evidence for or against it, it's very difficult um, because you, you are, you're talking about the desert, right? You're talking about wanderings. You're talking about how, how big is the group? And if you have more um, progressive interpretations of the text, maybe the group is much smaller. And so you don't expect so much evidence. Again, I think all of those things are problematic, but it makes the debate more difficult to really nail down. But one place that is incredibly problematic is the conquest of uh, Canaan under Joshua, at the end under Moses and the beginning under Joshua. So the story goes. So I, I left off just as just as the yeah. Jews were, were, were entering the Holy Land. That's right. Israel. Moses could peer into the Holy Land, but That's never right. entered it himself. That's where I stopped. The yeah. conquest is what immediately follows. That's right. So, you know, Moses brings the people, they wander around the wilderness for 40 years. Finally, they, you know, God says, okay, it's time. So start moving up toward Canaan. So that as they go up toward Canaan, they hit several cities on their way up, one in the Negev in the south, and they, they hit some on Transjordan. Um, and then they come, as you say, uh, to, you know, to the edge where, you know, Moses can see in and then he dies. And Joshua, you know, takes up, takes up, you know, the, the, the torch, um, and he's going to lead the children of Israel in to the land of Canaan. He's going to cross the Jordan River and he's going to wreak havoc. Um, and so what they do is this huge fighting force, according to the narrative, comes into Israel and conquers cities like Jericho, you know, the famous story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho. The walls came down that's right come come tumbling down um then they take the city of Ai. uh they take other cities like lachish and hatsor uh but but these cities are said to have been destroyed right uh several of them are just burned um and but but Israel takes the south, they take the north. In other words, that there's this massive conquest, this invasion, this invading force um, that takes over these Canaanite cities. So, because the text is explicit about these cities, and we know where these cities are, and they've been excavated, we should be able to go to the data. We should be able to go to the archaeological data and say, aha. Here, you can see in Jericho in the 15th century, or as more uh, you know, progressive interpreters would say in the 13th century, um, we have this destruction layer, right? Where we see all this burned, you know, this, 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 this ash, or uh, you know, at, at a minimum, a sign of this civilization, this Canaanite city going kaput 
and then an Israelite city for, being formed on top and of it. And all these other cities should be should have similar evidence at roughly the same time. That's exactly right. The ones and, and so what I what I did in my book, there's a there's a brilliant scholar by the name of Eric Klein. Uh, who wrote a book uh, from Eden to Exile? I think is the title, and he looks at some of these major stories from the Bible and says, "Like, all right, what can we really say about these things?" And the Exodus is one of them, uh, and the Conquest is another. And in the Conquest, what he does is he looks at several of the cities and says, "Okay, if they were actually destroyed like this, what should we expect to find?" And so what I did is I built upon his his scholarship and I extended. Uh, you know my the, the the purview just a little bit, but the the basic premise is the same, and that is if you go to the city of Jericho, for example, and the you know the story of the conquest in the book of Joshua says that Jericho was raised to the ground or whatever. That what do we see in the late Bronze Age, which is that time, either early or late, when the Israelites are supposed to have come in there and conquered it? Um, and what we see time and time again, uh, save for one, two, maybe three sites out of like 30, um, is that they just don't fit. Uh, so Jericho, for example, or the city of Ai, um, you know, or uh, outside of Israel that are supposed to have been destroyed, like um, Heshbon, Debon, the city of Arad, uh, these are either completely unoccupied and abandoned during the time that they're supposed to have been destroyed. Um, or with something like Jericho, there's just this like minimal occupation. It's like this, this village level uh, group of people with no massive fortifications surrounding it, right? It's just this little like nothing uh, place that people are sort of hanging out, you know, again, very, very small, unwalled. I once caught a fish that was this, yeah. <laughs> it was like, like, like really they catch a, 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 a tiny little minnow and it not this enormous. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Jericho um, was this massive fortified city. That's right. It was, you know, a few huts. Is, yeah. is that, is that basically? That's, that, yeah, that's, that, that's exactly right. And, and that's the best case scenario, right? Um, except for like the city of Hatsur. Uh, the city of Ai had been abandoned for what, like a thousand years, right? So like, nope, it was just in ruins. The word Ai means ruins, right? Um, same with Hebron uh, or uh, Heshbon and Debon and, and Arad. You know, these are cities that are just like, there's nobody there, right? There's nobody there. There's nobody there to conquer, much less evidence of destruction. And so when you when you see that, um, and again, I go into what, what people might say, nauseating detail uh, in, the, in the chapter. I don't think it's nauseating. But if you're interested in arguing the topic, and that's the point of the book, is to arm a person to say, all right, I'm going to go do a debate on um, you know, the, uh, uh, the conquest under Joshua and explain how it doesn't match the biblical text, or I'm going to have a discussion with Aunt Francine next Thanksgiving, because I know she's going to bring it up. Uh, that's the point of the chapter, right? Is to arm you with as much or as little information as you'd like uh, to be able to, to to make that case and explain it to someone. Um, but this is the real issue. So if the Exodus happens according to the traditional date in the middle of the 15th century, they wander for 40 years, that means at the end of the 15th century, you should see this massive invasion and series of destruction layers uh, in Canaan. Well. Not only do you not see that, there are no destructions and very little occupation, um, but Egypt is actually in control of Canaan during that time, right? We know a lot about this period historically. So <laughs> like, if, if we're holding to the traditional date, which is why nobody does anymore, um, except for, again, fundamentalist evangelicals, um, the reason that they don't is because you'd have the Israelites escaping from Egypt to wander around for 40 years and then go into what is ostensibly Egyptian land. <laughs> so, right. you know, uh, it doesn't really work. This is why people like Hofmeyer and Kitchen have had to push that date forward, right? push it down. Um, and so they say, well, actually, uh, we think that it fits better in the 13th century, not in the 15th century. 
uh, because there's there's more regional collapse taking place. Right. I just want to you've, you've something I've been wanting to ask because you've done this a lot. When you say the 13th century, mm. like, like clearly you don't mean like like the, the like 1400s of, of the Common Era. Or no, no, no. What a Christian would call AD. When, when so when you say when you're giving a time period, can you just define what you mean by the 13th century, the 15th century? What's yes. that like in the modern calendar? I see. Uh, yes, I'm so sorry. Um, so, so when, because we're talking about ancient history, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, everything is going to be BC or BCE before the common era. Uh, so, you know, like if you go back 2000, 22 years, you know, according to the calendar that we use, you know, you'd get you'd be back at oh, like zero. So this is the 13th century BCE. BCE. So it's, or it's as going, Christians would, would call it BC. BC. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Um, so uh, when I say the 13th century, then what that means is, you know, uh, 1299 to 1200. That's right. the that's the 13th century. It's it can it it takes a little while uh, in school to to get your head wrapped around it, uh, because if you say the 1300s, that's different than the 13th century. It's really frustrating. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Letting me vent a little bit there, <laughs> but uh, okay. So, so back to the evidence. I just wanted to ground that yeah, yeah. Uh, one fact. Thank you. So, no, no, that's, back uh, to the evidence. I appreciate you. Yes, dates uh, to to comport with the narrative. So that means that um, we have evidence of a of a wide geographical uh, area that underwent a series of collapses, right? Cities were destroyed or cities fell. And this happens right at the end of the 13th century BCE or right at the beginning of the 12th century. Um, and so because of that, uh, when you look at some of these cities, like Hatsor is one of them, uh, that date seems to line up a little bit better, right? It actually at Hatsor lines up pretty well if you if you take this later date. Um, and of course, they have to do this uh, because you have this other fixed uh, chronological point, and that is in the Exodus story, you have the cities of Pithom and Ramses. Well, they, they don't work. They weren't constructed uh, in time for the traditional date to work. But they work really well for this later date, um, and so. But but again, the problem is, and I show this uh, in some detail in the chapter, is that either whether you take this earlier traditional date that fundamentalist evangelicals take, or this later date that more progressive evangelicals would take, neither fit. Neither fit. Um, right. there's, there's still like, no matter you're damned, if you, <laughs> you're yeah. damned, if you do, and you're damned, if you don't either right. way, e either way, the, what we actually know of, uh, the way humans lived at the time is completely incompatible with the, the tale as told in the old Testament. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, you, you, you different, can't different, different pieces don't work depending on, on the dates, but either way, it just, it, it, it doesn't work. Yeah. Archaeologically speaking, you you would just expect you know in the middle of the 13th or the, the at last you know quarter of the the 13th century bc you would expect to find a whole bunch of destruction layers within a relatively short period of time of one another right. um and you just don't you right. just don't so so as you say there is actually a lot more detail i've i've read the chapter read but we have been talking now for about an hour this is one chapter in one of the volumes if you are interested in this, to any any of the listeners, uh, you, it's the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, Volume One, and the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, Volume Two. It's available in various online bookshops. Um, any any last thoughts? Because uh, otherwise, I'm going to keep you on here not just for an hour, but for a year. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say, because this seems like a, a really important point to to focus in on as we close is like, what, what are my goals? Um, and I think this is the way that I would want this to, to the, the listener to, to walk away thinking, what is it that Josh is out here doing? My goal is for people to understand what 
what scholars think about these topics. So the things that I write on in these books, like the dating of the book of Daniel, uh, or the failed prophecy of Ezekiel against uh, the city of Tyre, uh, or who wrote the Pentateuch? Did Moses write the Pentateuch? Um, or is there rape? Is there genocide in the Old Testament that's endorsed? Is there slavery that's endorsed? All these things that we talk about. Did the Old Testament plagiarize uh, earlier uh, Mesopotamian myths? All of these things, my goal is, is never to get someone to, to, to say, I don't believe in God anymore. I have no interest uh, that's not my. That's not my field. You used to be a, a, an evangelist, but you're not anymore. Even that's if, right. You know, you, you're not trying to evangelize that's right. for the other side. You're and you, I'm not you're knocking that altogether. And I just like I want to be clear. I'm not knocking that. Right. Uh, it's just not my field. It's not. It's not what I do. Uh, there are people that that I'm sure give very very good arguments. Um, obviously, for things like the destructive nature of religion, but I I don't have any authority in that field, so. I leave that up to the experts, right? For me, my goal is at least let's all get on the right page when it comes to the historical data, right? Let's all start from that foundation. I was just going to say, because in the end, what's so dangerous to me um, with something like slavery in the Old Testament is that people come to this, a Christian apologist will come to this and they'll say, well, you know wasn't so bad, right? It's just like paying off a debt. It's like paying off a credit card or something. And you know, it's, it's not such a big deal. And you know, certainly it's not like actual slavery like we saw in the antebellum South. Well, the reality is, yeah, it was. It's bad. Um, I have a, another book, Did the Old Testament Adore Slavery? That's what it's all about. Um, and the reason that that's such an important thing to me is not to make God, like, look like a big meanie or something. That's not my goal. My goal is so that people today don't make these arguments like, well, I mean, you know, yeah, sure, the Bible says, you know, in Exodus 21, 20, 20, that you could beat your slave. But I mean, how else would they keep their slave in line? And, you know, because I hear people say this all the time. Once a week, <laughs> I hear people say this. You know, it's not that slavery was bad. It's it's that they just didn't do it right. Hello? Hello, is this thing on? Like, do you hear yourself? This is what I'm fighting against. I'm fighting against people saying this stupid stuff that slavery is not so bad. It's just you have to do it right. This is what causes us to repeat history. And right. so when you, if, if, if you look at, uh, at what people are saying today, it's just such an easy step to then say, well, if it, if they just didn't do it right, maybe we should just try it again. Yeah, let's, let's, let's try it again. Yeah, we'll just do it better, right? And, and, and we'll do arranged marriages like this and we'll sell our daughters, right? It, it, like, we'll just do it right because the, the Bible says, the, the Bible says, um, and if you rape a, a, an unbetrothed virgin, you just marry her. You just marry her, right? You have to pay a heavy fine and you marry her and you can't divorce her. This is really the way we should be doing things. It's like, yeah, this is what I'm trying to do. Um, John Collins wrote a brilliant, easy to read book called What Are Biblical Values? Um and I highly recommend it to anybody that's interested in like what does the Bible actually say about things like abortion, slavery, rape, genocide. It's 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 not as much detail in some of these you know things like slavery and genocide as I go into in my book. But if you're looking for like a good overview of it, it's a great book to have. But really, the reality is his 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 bottom line is my bottom line. You should not be basing your values on an ancient text, right? Take from our moral progress what you know to be right, what you know to be wrong, and don't let an ancient text dictate to you things like, well, I, I don't know why I should, but I should really hate people that are gay, right? I don't know why, but the text says that I should, right? I should, I should really Therefore, try to restrict my moral right. obligation to do yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. Leave that behind. Leave that behind. So I guess, uh, so... 
you're uh, you're you're against the installation of biblical values into society. <laughs> but but if we're going to have that debate, and we can have that debate, it's it's important to have them on a factual foundation. Yes. So in a sense, your book is an attempt to establish the common ground. That is exactly right. On which the on which our our conversation can continue. So that is exactly that, right. Yes. All right. Well then. Uh, Dr. Josh Bowen, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, that was one chapter from one volume of, of the book. If you liked what you heard, uh, then there's there's a lot more to read in his two volumes. And when can we expect volume three? Uh, Megan's going to shoot me for saying something like this, but my goal is to try to have it out, um, ho hopefully by the end of 2023. I'm writing a second edition an updated version, uh, edition of Did the Old Testament Endorse Slavery right now. Uh, so that's going to come out first. But my goal is to uh, to try to have it out by the end of 2023. No promises, everybody, but that's that's my goal. Um, I will say this. If you, uh, you know, if you don't actually like getting physical copies of books and cracking them open, uh, there's this guy that read the audio version of both books on Audible. Uh, what is his name? Seth, Seth Andrews. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've heard of him. Yes. Yeah. I've heard of him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so if, uh, you know, I always tell people get the audio book just for his voice. It doesn't matter what he says. He started his career as, as a, as a, I think a college DJ and was on the radio for many years. So, oh. uh, he's, I, 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 I concur. Listening yeah. to him talk, listening to him do and read the phone book yes. would be would be worthwhile. <laughs> exactly. Reading, reading your reading your words would be far more interesting. I appreciate that. Yeah. So I I I yeah, it's it's great. It's a he did a wonderful job. So all right. Well, thank you so much for uh coming on to Podcast for Inquiry. This has been a great conversation and uh good luck with your writings in twenty twenty three. Thank you very much. It was an absolute pleasure. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Links for today's discussion can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe and engage in the conversation. Comment, rate, and review. Email us at podcast at centerforinquiry.ca. We'd love to hear your perspective. The Podcast for Inquiry is brought to you by the Center for Inquiry Canada. We are a national educational charity supporting reason, compassion, and secular values. To our supporters, thank you. If you have not yet contributed, please consider making a donation at centerforinquiry.ca slash donate or becoming a member at centerforinquiry.ca slash join. Your contribution supports our efforts to have rational and evidence-based decision-making everywhere. CFIC is on the web at centerforinquiry.ca. We are on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at CFI Canada. Podcast for Inquiry is produced and edited by Lee Shields, Zach Dumont, and Martin Zielinski. Music by Anthony Lazaro. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblood. See you next time. <laughs>